So Jake, you like had a storm the other day. Is it still? It's, it's over now, eh? Yeah, it's um, it's it's over and gone and passed. Um, it and it ended up where we live was not as bad as the ones, the one that we had last year. We had like we only ended up getting like around six or eight inches of rain. We had some gusty winds and stuff, which six or eight inches of rain in less than twenty four hours is still quite a bit. But you know they're predicting like fifteen to twenty inches of rain, so um it was not as bad where we were but not far from us it was like really bad the trees blowing over there was actually someone who who got killed because a tree had fallen over onto their trailer and they were home and it landed on them inside their trailer um which obviously is really sad um so yeah i mean it was a bad storm um and it just was one of those things where you know it just kind of makes you think just like as a father, that the more prepared you are, not just for storms, but for anything, you know, the more prepared you are, the better you can sort of navigate things, you know, for your family. And, and so that just was, I kind of thought like, it's a pretty good topic to talk about because obviously it plays into fatherhood, but also it's, it really speaks to, you know, something that's gone on recently. And, you know, interestingly for us, we're just really getting into like hurricane season. So like, end of August into September is where they have a tendency to like really get going. And so, you know, this may not be the end, you know, there, there could be more on the way. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things where the more prepared you are, the better off you're going to be. Otherwise you end up being like one of those like 5 million people at Walmart scrambling the day of only to find out that all the food is gone because everyone is there and all that type of stuff. So. You don't want to be in the arena to, uh, fight to get some toilet paper like how we saw yeah. not too long ago have you guys uh, ever heard the have you guys ever heard it said um ever heard the the question posed what is the best way to keep milk fresh i'm not expecting an answer just no you ever heard this yeah well, no, i haven't heard it no, the most heard reasonable that. answer the most reasonable answer is you keep it in the cow yeah, because you, cause, yeah, otherwise you got to have a refrigeration or something. The point what I'm trying to make, I thought that was going to hit a little harder to be honest. But no, the point I'm trying to good. make, yeah, I think that should be a tweet here from you here that's pretty a, shortly. I think that's oh, good. Okay, okay, okay. I, I got it in my notes here, right? I'll, maybe I'll tweet it. But the point I'm trying to make here is like part of being prepared isn't just having things on hand; it's having the pieces in place to be uh, ready for anything effectively. Like for example, here. On our land, whilst we don't have hurricanes, we do get windstorms um, that can knock trees over. I mean, I, I've filled up at one of our wood bay, wood firewood bays, with the wood that's come over in the storm. Unfortunately, you know, well, I don't know if we've had any loss of life in the area from it. Probably at some point, um, but yeah, it sounds like it was pretty pretty brutal where you were. Um, so yeah, my, my heart goes out to the the family that that happened to. But um, part of what I'm doing here on my land is putting pieces in place to be prepared for whatever might happen, um, be it a financial thing or, or you know, a, a weather event or earthquake or anything like that, because this is an earthquake prone area. And like, for example, we just did the, the fencing so we can produce our own meat. Um, we're milking sheep at the moment, though I tell you, I'm getting real sick of that. <laughs> it's a whole nother topic. Uh, <laughs> it's not the milking that I'm sick of, it's the, it's the sheep that I'm sick of. Um, but yeah, like put, putting pieces in place is really important to prepare us for whatever happens like you for example jake you're worried that you're going to lose power pretty reasonable thing to be concerned with especially if you have people that depend on the power um though i think well i don't know what it's like in the states but in new zealand they will like do everything in their power you know everything in their capability to come and make sure that you have power um and by they i mean the power company but really like for the average average man, we've got to take responsibility for that. And if electricity is important, we should have a generator. They're not that expensive for like a little basic one to run a fridge and or a freezer or whatever. Um, a freezer will stay cold pretty like a chest freezer will stay cold pretty a pretty long time. But like a fridge, yeah, that, that's a whole lot of food that could be spoiled. Uh, last time we had a storm, we had power issues. Eh? Was that like three or four days without power? Yeah, the last time. So it, it was kind of the the best uh, the best and the worst case scenario as far as the preparedness talk. So um, the last time we had a storm, we lost power for like three days. And there's actually people right now that still don't have power from the storm. We we were lucky, but there was 
some others that still are without power. There's a lot of flooding in some areas and stuff. But the last year, the storm knocked out our power for like three or four days. And so we were prepared from a standpoint that we had a generator on hand. And one of the things that we did that I felt like was I was researching and like, you know, we already have a lot of propane that we keep on hand because we use a pro like a gas grill. So we already have propane. So I was like, well, let's get a propane grill or a, gr- a propane generator. So that way it's easy. We already have the propane. You know, we don't have to try to get extra gas, you know, and all that type of stuff. So we get a propane generator. So that part was good. Like we're prepared. We're ready to go. What I did not realize until the power went out was that the generator that we had gotten was not powerful enough to run the the refrigerator. <laughs> and so like it was one of those deals where it was it was like I read just like the the first line of the wattage, but then it was like, but running wattage was not as high as the base wattage, which I did not even think about. And so it was like, oh well shit, like you know, okay, we have a generator, but now basically we can't do anything with it because it can't even keep the one thing we needed to keep going to keep going, you know? And so we went to plan B. We have one of those like seven day coolers or whatever that we also have for like when we go camping and that type of stuff. So we went down and just bought some ice and, and we put like our, especially we start with meat because that's like the most expensive stuff, put in meat in this like big ice cooler that we have and it was totally fine. And so then I made the most of the situation. I ended up selling the generator so we get a different one. But, you know, in that moment, it was like bad because I didn't fully pay attention. But then it was good because we did have other ways of still keeping our stuff safe. So I think it's important to, like, learn from these situations, too. Like, you know, the the thing, the things that you mess up, you have to, like, learn from those. So when you're not prepared the first time that something happens, write that down. And then the next time right. something happens, you're prepared for it. I think back to the the dark years of not too many years ago. And uh, what I started doing is whenever I would go to the store and there was they were out of something that we were looking for, I started writing down, like we came to the store for this and we were out of stock. They were out of stock on it or whatever. So you're like, okay, there's supply issues there. The next time we go there, if they had it in stock, I would get at least a little bit more than what I would have gotten because they had been out of it the last time to cover us for the next time. You know, I think that, uh, in, in your scenario, you know, like you, you tried to cover for it with like having a propane generator, but, um, you know, you take note that oh, that wasn't quite enough, you know, next time right. let's go, go bigger. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that because that was like one of the first things I thought of as far as like talking points that I wanted to bring up was, it's always a learning, like part of being prepared is learning from your past mistakes, you know, like that's how we figure anything out really. I mean, like we're all sitting here doing this podcast because we, you know, this is something we decided to do, you know, a year ago, we didn't have any, you know, inkling that this would even be a thing. It's because we learn things, learn what to do, learn what not to do, you know, and, and that's just such a big thing, you know, to, to be able to find growth. Yeah, exactly. And just adding on to uh, what you were saying before, have you guys ever heard the saying two is one, one is none? Yes, I yeah. have heard that one. I've heard that yeah. one. I haven't heard the, the, the milk, the fresh the milk, milk the, one, yeah, but I've heard milk two is the, one, one is okay. none. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's an important thing to, to know as well. Like Jake, perfect example. You had the generator, but you also had a backup plan as well. So yeah, you weren't caught without. Like if you didn't have the cooler, the seven day cooler, then you would have been stuck and you probably would have had a great feast of meat because you cook it all, you know. But, um, you know, the, the, we would have grilled all day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we would have had a good alternative. But, you know, having that as a means of, of backup was, was, was a smart move. Like with us, uh, we all of our, like from our mower to our generator to our whatever else, you know, cars, they all run on. I don't know what you guys have over there, but we call it 91 unleaded. I've seen like your gas pumps and it's like got like 88 and 87 or whatever it is. Um, we have only the premium stuff over here, 91. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, or we have a whole uh, bunch of canisters of 91 unleaded. So we can use that if we run out of, like, about, for whatever reason, there's a, I mean, a, there might be, who knows, a gas shortage or, you know, the, the uh, mower runs out of gas, right, got to fill it up. And then when they empty, it's all, just a rotational system. When one's empty, just put it near the car. Next time you go out, just fill it up. And so it's always available. Um, and having, like, systems that like that in place, that are kind of 
and obviously not automatic, but the next best thing, you know, is almost a, a essential. And like what you were saying, Trent, with the you know, replenishing or, or getting extra of what there seems to be shortages of, very smart move. Anybody out there should really be, when they go shopping, if they haven't set it up already, when they go shopping, just buy a couple of extra things. So let's say you like canned corn, buy a couple of extra cans of corn. If you like, you know, pinto beans, get a couple of extra cans of pinto beans or, or dried, you know, a, a bag of dried beans or whatever it might be. Extra herbs, extra tea, extra coffee, just a little bit every week. It doesn't have to be at this huge expense if you can't afford it up front. Um, and then the added effect of doing it in a, in, over a gradual period of time, especially with non-perishables, is you can create like a cycle. So you put the the newest things at the back, like if you have a shelf that, that has some depth, put the newest things at the back and then bring all the older stuff forward. And you just go through the system and eventually you'll have a, a pantry, a, a larder, that you can go into and just pull from as you need. And then when it's done, you just write down whatever you've used and then next time you go to the supermarket or whatever, just pick it up and eventually you just get to the point where it's just replenishment and it's not you know getting excess all the time and um that's kind of a system i think anybody really should have whether you're going through a hurricane um and and you know you need to make sure you've got food on hand in case there's flooding on the roads or um, you hit financial strife and you need a means to feed your family and not have too much of a disruption to your diet i see a lot of guys out there but not a lot but a few um, go out there and they'll like buy canned mackerel and all this other stuff. It's like, do you ever eat canned mackerel? <laughs> no, then why are you buying it? You know, because at least if you're spending money on the stuff that you know you're, you're actually going to consume, you're going to use it, and it's not wasted money ever, really. Um, you're probably going to get a few things that you miss out on here and there, but in general, it's going to be stuff that you use. So having these systems in place and implementing the two as one, one as none is, is essential, um, regardless of whatever it is you're preparing for. I'm addicted to canned and dried foods for sure. I'm like, a, like you said, like if I, if I am doing something where I'm like, oh, I need two cans of corn, I grab three or four and then like every single time. And it's, yeah, it's, I have a pretty nice pantry stocked up, but I'm also, I'll use the stuff if I, uh, whatever, like beans and rice is a nice little meal you can throw together, um, in a pinch. So, well, there's a lot of like a good way to cover like, I'm sorry, you go ahead. I was just gonna say, like that's yeah. I was just gonna say that's also a good way to um, just to cover yourself, like from a finance and budget standpoint. You know, like that's not yeah. There's like the disaster, natural disasters or power goes down, things like that. But you know, like my wife, I mentioned, you know, my wife and I are both teachers, so it's like not a secret that you know the end of the summer, right before the new school year, is like the worst time of the year for teachers because you know, you're, you don't get paid all summer, you know, so you have to like budget your money and you have to, you know, do those things. But it's also a matter of like preparing ahead of time. Like if, if it's a situation where like, say we know we have like extra money, one of the first things we do is we buy like extra meat and put it in our deep freeze, you know, cause then at some point there's going to be a come a time where it's like, Hey, maybe we don't have extra or maybe we just have enough. So it's like, Hey, we don't even have to worry about getting meat this week because we already have a bunch of meat on hand and so that's something that we've kind of learned over the years like hey if there's times where there's extra get extra because there's gonna be other times where you're like you may not have as much so preparedness is definitely a form of savings like absolutely sure. yeah there's a book yeah. series that um i like it's only two well there's more than two books but the core series only has two books and this guy patrick rothfuss if you're listening if you ever find this by chance Release, release the last book it's been like 10 years man he just seems to refuse to release it but there's this one line and about halfway maybe three quarters of the way through the second book i've read each of them a couple of times um and again I, i'm terrible at quotes so i'm gonna butcher this but the the main character goes through um like a few different villages while he's traveling and there's just this one line that always stuck with me and it's something like i passed through village some villages where they kept their savings and, and through simple things or through simple means, a can of um, a can of oh, not a can like a a, a, um, a dried ham or like a um, jar of jerky or a few cans of apples or something like that, um, and that always just stuck with me like you know the whole like keeping their savings and simple things because oftentimes we have this idea and you know money is a very versatile asset and ultimately you know as providers we need to be accumulating capital as well but also if you could live your entire life, I think it's important to picture if you could live your entire life without money, what would, what would be the most important things for you to have on hand? Like if, if suddenly all money, all money got wiped out, you know, 
or, or we went to like a digital dollar and you said the wrong thing about Greta Thunberg or something like that. And all of a sudden your, your access to your savings were panned, right? So what would be the things that you would want on hand to help protect your family? Those are probably a better choice for your savings past like a few thousand for an emergency that you should start purchasing. So it might be a generator. If suddenly you couldn't use your credit card to go and get XYZ, if there was like a, uh, we had a day here where, side side story, I know a little bit of a tangent. We had a day here where the um, the, the credit card system, the FPOS system we call it here, went, went out. So nobody could use their card. And like there were like huge queues at the gas station and stuff. I always keep cash on hand. So well, not as much as I used to now, admittedly, but at the time I you know, had, had at least $1,000 in cash. And so I just, when, when I found out that was happening, I was like, okay, I'll just take a few, few hundred dollars out with me today in case I need it. And it was like, it was almost like a, not a fierce thing to say, but it felt very cool, <laughs> maybe, being able to just go to the gas station and being like, yes, I filled it up. Here's the money for it. Done. You know, it was like, no, no problem. Whereas like everyone else was kind of like stuck or, you know, couldn't get access to this. And the guy was like having to make notes of who I would want and running down credit card numbers and stuff. Not a problem. You know, cause you're wow. ready for it. It was, uh, it was hectic. It was chaos. And especially because we were in the capital city, which is already busy enough. So you can imagine just how chaotic it was, you know, with a million people, or whatever, um, without access to that sort of form of savings. I don't think you need to go like all doomsday prepper mode per se. Oh, no, but not like, at all. I mean, there is there is a form of I mean, with through inflation and and those kinds of things, as long as your food is like still is shelf stable, it's worth more. Like if you buy you know, a can of corn, let's say in the United States, a can of corn last year was like 47 cents. Now it's 77 cents. Like every can of corn you have is worth 20 cents more. I mean, that's pretty decent return on investment for, for what you're, what you're getting, you know? And, uh, that, that's just the side point. I mean, it literally is, um, a saving, it's a savings account in a way, you know, but might save your family's life as well. Well, yeah, exactly. And like, uh, I think with like all these kind of philosophies that kind of seem, I mean, not all of them, that's a, that's, that could get me in trouble. Not all of these philosophies. <laughs> Some of these philosophies that are outliers that are often looked upon or shamed to a certain degree. Like, I'm sure you guys have heard the show Doomsday Preppers. I've never actually seen it, but I've seen the shorts for it. And it seems like they're really um, trying to make them seem a bit silly or a bit goofy, probably intentionally. But, you know, the, they find the extreme outliers. I mean, exactly. Like yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. That's what the good content is, is the people that are so into yes. it. that Like <laughs> everybody in everybody in town's talking about them. You know? Yes. Yes. That type. But, you know, I, I think that that isn't really an, a fair assessment of the mentality around that um, philosophy in general. And when you come across these I, ideas or uh, alternative ideals for individuals, there's a lot you can kind of glean from them without necessarily adopting that philosophy yourself. So it doesn't just necessarily apply to like financial philosophy. It could be anything, well, not anything, but a lot of things. But when we look at things like, you know, doomsday preppers who are preparing for the end of the world, a lot of the time you can see that they become very passionate. Like a lot of people who are driven by things that are um, to protect their family or themselves or, or, they become almost obsessed or maybe fanatical might be a better word. Um, you can see the passion that comes through. Like one of the best books I've ever read on gardening, um, at least, you know, gardening on a budget, is um, Gardening When It Counts. And I actually had, at my old job, I was like, and this stuck, this moment stuck with me. This is like 11 years ago now, man. <laughs> so like this, this boss who was like a complete knob comes up to me like in front of the lunchroom and he's like, what are you reading that for? And I was like, oh, I like gardening. And he goes, yeah, but it's a doomsday book. What, you think the world's going to end? Why are you working here then? And I was like, well, these guys have the most passion about anything. That's why I read it. And he was like, oh, oh yeah, you know. Um, he's a complete knob. But um, the the reason I chose to read that book was not because I think, like, you know, we're going to have a meteor strike, even though the, the author maybe thought a few things. <laughs> but, you know, not because I think there's going to be, like, a meteor strike and we're going to be underneath a, a cloud of ash or whatever, um, you know. I think the lucky ones would be the ones who don't make it in that case. And we wouldn't be like uh, worried about what variety of Peter plant. But um, the passion that came through and what he wrote was, you know, um, contagious, basically. So like you're reading it and it gets you excited to garden. It's not like, uh, it's not getting me excited for an asteroid strike, but at least excited to go and plant some peas, you know. 
I, I was given I was given Jake a chance to jump in there. I, I was gonna say, you know, like even um I don't know if you have anything like it in um in New Zealand, but I'm sure you could go online and find something. But like around here we have um options, even like uh army surplus stores and stuff like that. But you can find stuff online or even like Costco has knockoff versions of like MREs. Did you can get a whole case of MREs that are like, and this is this is getting into like some you know doomsday prepper type stuff. But the point being that you could protect your family for a few days by investing less than a hundred dollars in a case of meals that are going to be ready to eat like ten years from now, twenty years from now. I mean, for less than a hundred bucks, you can protect your family for at least a few days of not having access to even things like water like clean water and um heat and stuff like that any type of way to all those mres are i mean they're ready to eat meals and they usually have everything inside them that that you need to even like clean water some of them have the the water cleaning um strips and stuff in them so that's interesting i've looked into those here but they weren't really an option maybe maybe they are now but um when i looked at them it was like this, they just weren't economical it's like you may as well just buy the food and uh you know not go anywhere <laughs> i suppose the mre is better when you're on the go because they're compact but um one thing i have seen yeah have, have you guys I ever think seen... you can like preserve food you can i mean there's really good food oh, yeah. preservation methods too yeah you like know? our like, pemmican and stuff home. like that um i don't mm -hmm. know if you guys that, that, well, that also of... gets into so i was ahead. gonna say that also gets into like the skill set you know like oh, yeah. skills are also a really big part of it i mean like there's certain you know people that are going to be way more prepared just because of their ability to hunt or fish or both, you know, like that's another thing. I mean, like I love going fishing because I love doing it like for fun, you know, it's like a recreational thing, but at the same time, like if it came to that, it's also could be a, a source of, you know, food or, you know, those types of things, same with hunting and, you know, like that kind of ties in with the food preparation stuff too. I mean, you know, like how, what percentage of the population would know to how to go and you know hunt kill and preserve an animal you know that they could then you know eat without a freezer even because you know like say hypothetically and i know that's also getting into more of the whole doomsday thing but like the power is out you know for a really long time you know um how many people would actually know how to do that you know if they were forced to you know i mean my suspicion would be it's a pretty small percentage you know um it's kind of interesting like we were talking about this there's a um a real an older movie probably like in the early 90s that i remember watching a long time ago it was called um i think it was called the trigger effect and it basically was about this giant mass power outage in los angeles i think it was los angeles and basically just like what would happen you know and it's like this family and they have a small child and there's no power and of course like people start like trying to break into homes and people are freaking out and they're trying to leave the city and it was like it wasn't like like an academy award winning movie or anything but it was pretty interesting just to see like just to think about like what would happen you know like are you truly prepared to not only you know sustain yourself but also protect yourself i mean that's a big part of it too la seems like the worst place to be if something like that happened <laughs> get out of the cities everyone yeah. but uh, yeah the yeah. being yeah. in a city in general would be the worst for sure yeah every single like zombie apocalypse thing always devolves into the collapse of society and it becomes more about human versus human interaction than even the zombies are oh yeah concerned. absolutely so it's an interesting uh, hypothetical um you know i think zombies are kind of done to death but like taking it past that i actually read through all of the, the i haven't watched the show we're not past like a certain point but uh the walking dead the comics are i mean yeah. eventually it's like everybody's gay and you know you can see like the effect of the cultural zeitgeist affecting the writer whatever his name is so eventually like every single character is gay uh, including jesus apparently and i'm not joking um felt like a big like uh insult personally but um the 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 book the, the general theme of the graphic novels are good um i, I think they're worth reading if you have nothing else better to do <laughs> i hope you probably do um but you know if, if you want like just entertainment i think they're worth going through um, I was going to say before on on the topic of water. Have you guys ever seen Life Straws? Have you ever heard of these? Yeah, yeah, I have one. Actually, I have two of them. I think. Yeah, they're definitely worth having. I think. Like, if you 
Yeah. What is this? They're like a little straw, oh, and they straw. have a bunch of different filter materials in them, and they take out like ninety nine point mm. nine nine percent of contaminants. Like you can effectively. Yeah. I don't know how true this is, but I I think you could theoretically drink pee, and it would be it would be water. I don't know how true that is. Sponsored don't try it. Bear, sponsored <laughs> by Bear Grylls. <laughs> yes. It's not sponsored by Bear Grylls. He does have his line of stuff, but no, I yeah, the life straw. We have a couple. They say that like you can like drink from like random ponds, you know, it doesn't have to be boiled and all that type of stuff. Um, we have a couple. Um, just the first one I bought just because I thought it was kind of cool the idea when I was like a lot younger, but then we got another one and one of them I have drank out of one before just to see what it was like. I mean, I don't know. Like, do we know for sure that it works? No, because Would you drink out of that it? situation. I just drank from like like a pond or whatever, just like just to test it out and see if I would get thick or anything like that i mean i didn't so i mean theoretically it works but yeah you know i could have just got lucky as well so who knows well either either it's safe or this is all a fever dream <laughs> yeah <laughs> one of the two you got some like uh some kind of pond plankton floating around in you waiting to right. take over that's probably why i now enjoy fishing so much if anything <laughs> yeah because so you could You're be one with the fish patient zero right, of the right. next zombie apocalypse <laughs> i have so, looked into some of those old like pres i think that it's worth um uh this goes to like the whole reading uh the lindy books or whatever people say like reading books that are over 50 years old or whatever but uh but going back and reading some of those old manuals for even um from the early 1900s or like the like the settlers and stuff like that some of those manuals had so many good techniques for like survival and and preservation of foods like uh that stuff's kind of been lost to time i mean for obvious reasons because of refrigeration and convenience and all that stuff but those books are still around they're collecting dust on your at your maybe not new zealand but here in America, they're they're collecting dust on all of our used bookstore shelves. Um, yeah, I, I've seen I've seen a couple of those floating around, and and every time I leaf through one, I want to buy it, <laughs> but I don't buy all of them. I already have a couple, so. Well, there's a lot of the, like a, a yeah. sense around, uh, and this is building what you were saying before, Jake. You know, people that have the skills to hunt, fish, whatever, will do a lot better, um, regardless of what it does. Like what. We're not really even specifically talking about doomsday collapse kind of things here. Just in general, um, if anything were to happen, or or you lost your job, or whatever it might whatever it might be, having these skills is handy. But there's a lot of I'll do it on the day kind of mentality around it. Like, oh, if I want to garden, I just chuck some seeds in the ground and they grow. It's more complicated than that. And if you want to go fishing, you don't just chuck some bait on the end of a on the end of a hook and some string and chuck it in the water. There's more to it than that. You know, it's it's you know, th th there's so many layers and, and facets to these skills that do take time to develop that you know if you are taking it seriously you should go out of your way to develop them now um like for example butcher the first animal i ever butchered was like a mess man it was like terrible like, I, I would be I, if i ever served anybody i'd be embarrassed but yeah you know, now it it's nothing you know like i mean i don't still don't like doing birds um i'm not very good at plucking the feathers i don't know what it is i hate it um, that's why I'm always hesitant to like butcher a chicken or something like that. And also why I, we had, I don't know if I told you this, but we had like 60 ducks at one point. And that's why I sold them. I was like, oh, we're going to eat all these ducks. And I like butchered maybe 10 of them. And by the 10th, I was like, let's just sell the ducks. I'm so sick of this. Uh, it's just such a pain. Um, now we've got these buckets full of feathers. And I'm like, what am I going to do with these? But, um, you know, the pillows. Yeah. I just, just going to make one pillow for <laughs> my make it uh, make a make the uh make it out of rabbit skin or something like that but um like after after doing it like at least i know how and i can do a decent job of it um i wouldn't say like i'm an expert or anything but i can do a decent job of it and you can always start out small like the first thing i ever butchered was a hare that unfortunately wandered onto our property um unfortunate for the hare <laughs> not unfortunate for me or the dog but um, you know, we wound up um, because you know I, I didn't have the skill set at the time. We went up like chasing this hair around the property until it was tired. I think it was one of you guys saying last week. You know, like you know, you basically just follow the follow the prey until it's tired. That was us around around the ten acre section, like just a dog chasing it around and then me rerouting when the dog got tired until the hair ran out of steam. 
Um, and then, you know, just walk up to it and pop it in the head, because you can't shoot a moving hair, well, you can't shoot a moving hair with a slug gun. Maybe with a rifle you could, but not a slug gun. Um, but yeah, and then I butchered that, and it was just, like, terrible. Like, I just watched a, a couple of YouTube videos, and I was like, yeah, I got this. I didn't have it. It was pretty messy. Um, but now, no problem. Like, it's just like, when you go to pull that skin off, it's just like pulling a sock off, you know, almost. Not quite, but similar. Um, and, you know, that, and once you start with these small skills, you can work up to the bigger ones, like, from there, it was easier to do a duck and chicken. Um, I presume I haven't done anything bigger than a large rabbit um, or a large hare, rather, at this point. But I assume kind of the same to do a sheep, just bigger. Um, but then you got the problem of like preserving the skin and stuff, which is probably going to be a challenge. I won't say this year, but early next year, um, or maybe mid next year, we'll be facing because we we just did the fencing here, kind of getting a bunch of sheep do for meat, um, not for milk, for meat. So that'll be interesting but now I feel confident to go ahead and do that if it was like 10 years ago I would have wanted to do it but I wouldn't have had the skill set so just like taking those incremental steps to get there um kind of kind of necessary really like whether it's you know I think you, you bring up an ex interesting point about like I mentioned finding like an old manual from like a used bookstore but probably more accurately like we live at a time period where we are at a crossroads of having all of this um, information at our fingertips you're like a youtube or a google link away from watching a video on how to butcher something which is frankly probably like a thousand times better than reading how to butcher one like in a 1900s uh manual but um i think i th like you said you should start working on those skills now if if it's important to you to be able to be prepared for to have to protect your your family or protect your livelihood even if it is something like just losing your job being anti-fragile in that way um you know if i lost my job i know i for sure can put fish on the table at the very least so um but uh i guess i would probably behoove people to like get a get like a little journal or something and and at least take notes on what people are telling you on youtube so that if you do lose power, you don't have to rely on YouTube videos for doing this stuff. You won't be able to because you won't be able to charge anything to uh, to, to watch them. You have to, you've got your twenty percent <laughs> left in your battery or whatever, and that's it. So it's um, I mean, it even really boils down to that, doesn't it? Like making sure you have alternative resources. Like it's good to have your phone charged and, and try and keep it above a certain percentage. Um, you know, I, I assume we're all of a similar ilk that we don't want to like. I, don't, I personally, don't, I'm not a big phone guy, but if I, my phone's like below 80%, I start to get nervous. I'm like, oh man, I've really got any charge left. <laughs> so I- uh, Am I gonna make it through? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, the, the other thing is like having an alternative that doesn't rely on power. Like, you, let's say you can't get access to YouTube. Let's say the, the internet goes down for whatever reason. I think the internet's probably more fickle than we believe it is. You know, it feels like this um, omnipresent resource, but I imagine there's like probably like a, a cable somewhere, not not literally, but you know, probably a cable somewhere that if it's not jiggled in the right way, it's <laughs> the whole thing runs, it, you know, goes goes out. So having alternative resources like um, like manuals and stuff like that are really important. It was a time, I, I really like books. Um, I'm not a big like collector or anything like that, but I do have like a compendium of resources on every aspect of raising animals or an, any animal that I would be interested in raising. I have a whole bunch of books on gardening. I have a whole bunch of books on working on cars. Well, not a lot, but a couple of books on working on cars. Um, just stuff like that. And having them as a means for you to, like, reference in case you ever need them. Hopefully not, but if you ever do. It just seems really sensible. You, I mean, if you can go down to a second-hand bookstore and pick up, you know, mechanics for dummies or something like that, it's probably, like, a dollar, you know. It's probably worth picking that up. Unless you've got, like, a Tesla or something, then you're out of luck. But you know, if you have, have a real car, <laughs> sorry Elon, but if you have a real car, then it'd pay to have that knowledge at least at your disposal in case you needed it. You know, there's, there's a lot of guys that can't even jump a car now. I don't actually know how many guys' cars have jumped, I'm just trying to think. In the past four years, I've jumped at least one guy's car per year. Not not woman, not woman guys' cars. And they're just like clueless, like, oh, the car's not starting, I just walk up, you need to jump. Like, what do you mean? Your, your battery's flat that's why it's making that ticking noise oh okay could you help yeah you know, you know pull the car up jump there are you a mechanic or something no 
I just know how to jump a car. It's like, you should know this, man. But it's, it's surprisingly common. Surprisingly common. And, you know, us having, even just the level of being prepared of just having a set of jumper leads in the car. I don't have one of those wind-up crank things or anything like that. Just a pair of jumper leads. Generally, that you know, a few dollars. And then you can get yourself out of a jam. Or get other people out of a jam if you feel socially responsible to do that. It just surprises me how many people are so unprepared they don't even know when their battery's flat in their car. You know, I ask them, when was the last time you changed your battery? What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? What do I mean? you got to change the battery. You know that, right? But, you know, they're just completely powerless or, or uh, ignorant of that. And, you know, you can kind of tell when it's time to change the battery, you know. Um, you know, if, if, if uh, you know, it's uh, uh, not cranking as quickly or whatever, you've got to, you know, you might be thinking, oh, maybe it's time. I, I know for mine, I'm probably going to have to change the battery within the year. Um, it's been, been been probably two years since I did that. But, um, you know, it's it's something that you should know as a man. It's a very basic skill. You don't have to be a mechanic. You don't have to, have, you know, jack it up or do anything like that. It's just pop the bonnet, change the battery. Pop the bonnet, jump the car. Not a big deal. But it's just surprising how frequently th that I have run into men that have been able to jump their car. Very basic skill. So, sorry if you can't jump your car, but hopefully now you can. <laughs> You ever heard the saying that if you can't fix it, then you don't own it? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe not this specifically. It sounds familiar, but yeah. I don't think I've heard it like in that, that exact way. Yeah, if you can't fix it, then you don't own it because you have to pay somebody else to fix it. That's true, yeah. Or well, hire, yeah, bring somebody else in to... And I, I mean, you know, within reason, I suppose. Yeah, within reason, yeah. But I think that... Yeah, but I think that we've gotten farther and farther away from that. I well, mean, it's like a it's a sovereignty end. thing, isn't it? Really, like it's if you're always relying on everything else around you to facilitate your life, then you kind of lack sovereignty. You lack control over yourself and your environment. You're kind of at the behest of other people. And I mean, we as people, we're not islands. You know, we need to rely on other people for certain things. But we should, to a certain degree, be self-sufficient. That doesn't mean like you have to like go into your own homespun tunics or whatever. But you know, we should be self-sufficient to a degree. We should be able to make our own, um, you know, cook our own meals. That's very basic. How how often have you heard of people that can't cook? It's wild. It's surprising how many people can't yeah. cook. And it must be more prevalent over there. Something than you have to here. do every day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've done it every day. Since I've been an adult. An adult, basically. You know, except for when I live with my parents, but it's a bit different. You know, it's like shared responsibility kind of thing. But, you know, there has to be some kind of, co you know, these basic skills of food preparation, making sure that you can provide for yourself, doing your own finances. It's like there's only, there's a certain set of skills every man has to have. And if you don't have them, I was going to say, are you really a man? But <laughs> I kind of think I want to say that. Are you really a man? Or can you really take care of yourself? Can you really take care of your family? if you are completely at the behest of the powers that be. You know, it, it doesn't mean that you have to be like an expert mechanic, an electrician, a plumber or whatever, but if you have a skill set that is uh, valuable enough that you can hire those people and it's not you know, going to uh, uh, make you destitute, then that would probably be something that would compensate for that. If you can't prepare your own meals and you always have to eat out, um, I don't see how that's possible, but apparently it is, then, you know, you're kind of screwed if uh, the the internet ever goes out. There's a power outage. You know, what are you going to do? If you don't have some food at home, you go to the supermarket every single day to get fresh food. And there are people out there that go to the supermarket every three days because they don't have enough stocked at home. Which to me, I would never feel comfortable with that. But some people, it's just so far from their mind that they don't think of that. Then if anything happens, well, the grocery store is always going to be there. Yeah, the exactly. Store is always going to be there. But if it happens one day that there's some, you know, uh, event that happens and we have we're having brawls in the car park over toilet paper, yeah, you know, that is that the kind of environment that you want to put yourself or worse your family into? I wouldn't. I wouldn't if people are fighting over you know rolls of of mashed up tree, <laughs> you know, it's just insanity. But it happened and people seem to have forgotten about it, which is just a whole other conversation. But, you know, I would not feel comfortable doing that, put it, put it, subjecting my family to that. Um, or, uh, okay, you might have noticed, uh, I'm doing my best to hide it, but I hurt my neck the other day, right? I don't know how, man. I was just like, I was fine in the morning, 
And then by about midday, I couldn't turn my head. Even now it's like, I can't turn it very far. It's painful. Um, and like, like it got to the point where like the pain was like spreading up into my jaw and I was like, man, I don't want to go to the doctor for this. I'm getting better now. I'm all right. But you know, if something happens to you and you're injured and you know, we have like ACC and everything here, which is like, um, a workers comp, I think you guys call it over there. Um, but you know, that, but they're not going to cover me because I'm self-employed. They don't give a shit. But you know, they, right. the idea is that if something happens to you and you can't do X, Y, Z, then you have a backup plan in place. Like, um, what I realized is that my wife needs to learn to milk this dang sheep because despite the fact that I had this pain in my neck, I still have to milk the sheep because she can't do it. And so now I'm like, man, I need a backup plan. Either I'm going to have to train one of the kids or my wife's just going to have to get a grip on and do it. So, um, yeah, there's like these backup plans that you've got to put in place to help protect yourself as well. If something happens, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, asteroid from the sky, zombie apocalypse kind of thing. It can be like you turned your head a funny way or something i didn't even know it happened and now your neck hurts and then you get a shipment for your e-commerce store and you got to unpack those and they're heavy boxes and you got to carry them with those pain you know it's just it, it sucks but you, sometimes you have to do these things but they ha you have to be prepared for the worst and you can't prepare for everything i couldn't prepare for this obviously um maybe i could have somehow but i don't, I don't know how but um we do have to be prepared to some degree to protect ourselves and our family and there's just so many guys out power there power outages like power outages are they feel like they're more common than they used to oh yeah i don't know if that's just my i mean yeah, i would say like so the, the grid's overloaded by all the stuff we have running on it or it's just know? been around longer or as people, well people yeah people are using out. more air conditioning than they have and not in like the sense of like a, a global warming way but just that people don't use their people don't suffer through like 70 plus degree days anymore like they used to you know i mean suffer through like open up some windows like people don't really do that anymore um you know and i think that that has really bogged down um our system on top of people are plugging their cars and stuff into the grid now so well, that's the other thing isn't that's it? probably yeah. good for it yeah there's a lot more demands um you'd be surprised with how much of those demands actually come from the industrial industries as well like we have i can't remember the exact number but we have an aluminium smeltery here. I don't know if it's still here. I haven't been keeping up with the news. But that drew like 20% of the power, the, the country's electricity or something like that. Nuts. Nuts how much electricity that drew. Um, because, you know, they shut down the coal industry here. So it was like, now they've got to use electricity. And it just was a huge drain on the system. And we're, we're pretty power abundant here. Um, but that doesn't give them an ex that, that doesn't give them a reason to charge less for the electricity either. But, um, you know... You'd be surprised with just how much demand comes from the industrial sector um, for electricity. That is so something to be aware of. Um, you know, as same as thing around me with like steel manufacturing. Yeah, steel manufacturing drains a lot of. Um, it affects the grid pretty pretty heavily. I suppose the uh, there's there's one a line. I mean, I don't I don't mean to be like the guy with all the one liners this uh, this particular recording. But um, there's one line in a book that I've been listening to recently um, that I liked. It's a fantasy novel. And I may have said this before, but it was something along the lines of we're three generations from feudalism. Like of everything we lost, right. the smart people didn't have access to the resources that we have at our fingertips now. And three generations would be back to like knights and castles and, and kings, basically. Because there's like a, most people can't, do the things that we rely on most people can't replicate so like the average person couldn't make a, a high in new zealand at least couldn't make a hydropower plant or a or a wind turbine um and then if they could make a wind turbine could they make let, let's say they could um make one out of a a car alternator and a couple of plastic barrels well if those plastic barrels break and they can't get new plastic barrels then are they going to be able to make a make an alternative to them okay maybe they can make them out of wood a little bit heavier but it's less efficient. Now the alternator breaks. Well, can they get a, uh, can they replace it? Yeah, but can they wire a new one? Probably not, you know, and, and the list goes on. Um, so like in three generations, it'll, it will kind of, we're, we're very, I think our situation is a lot more precarious than we care to admit. And being prepared, um, not only in our, our resources that we have in our fingertips, generators, you know, uh, propane on hand, coolers, whatever it might be, you know, it's also about us becoming more capable as men 
and having that, that those skill sets and developing those as well. Because you know, if we do, for whatever reason, head back toward feudalism, I think the people who will become kings are those who have the wisdom and the uh, strength to uh, lead and counter, or at least slow the decline. Because um, those are the guys who are going to come away with more resources at the end of the day. Um, but that's just my take on it. I just thought that was an interesting line in the book that I thought I'd um, thought I'd share. I think it's also like a mindset thing, you know, like the, your mindset about how you respond to different things says a, a lot as well. Like, you know, you were talking a minute ago, you know, about your neck and how it's like this sudden thing where it's like one minute you're fine, the next minute all of a sudden, you know, you have a problem. So, you know, your what you described on what you had to do says everything about your mindset because it was like, well, I need to come up with a plan B for the future if this happens again, but because I don't have one, now I just still have to go do this. You know, and the reality is there's a lot of people that, you know, if in a similar situation would just be like, well, the hell with it, I guess it isn't getting done today. You know, like I'm sore or, you know, my my neck hurts and so it's just not going to happen. And I think that really speaks a lot to it as well. You know, like a lot of the things we've been talking about, you know, the people that don't, you know, um, they, they have a couple of days worth of groceries and they go back to the store, you know, and it's like, well, that's great until what happens if the store shuts down on power or something, you know, it's a mindset thing, you know, being able to see kind of like the long-term vision of something requires a certain level of, you know, mindset that, gives you the ability to see those things and then you also have to have the i guess the the mental fortitude to actually see it through you know like obviously for me like i pay attention a lot to marriage it's the same idea you know like people used to not get divorced as much because when something was broken they found a way to fix it as opposed to well we'll just get a new one you know nowadays if something gets broke we just throw it out and get a new one and unfortunately it's kind of what's happening with marriages you know it's like oh it's broke no needing to fix it i'll just go find a different person you know like there's certain certain things that require a certain mindset to overcome things. Otherwise, you just kind of keep repeating the same things over and over again. There's a tweet in there somewhere. I'm making a note of that. I'm going to message you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But um, the, the last thing I think is, is kind of um, important to talk about in terms of preparation is putting something in place that can help you or help your family should circumstances worsen so that, that's kind of a generic thing to say but let's say you're earning as much in your job we were just talking before this call about how much an electrician i'm an electrician by trade for anyone listening who doesn't know that um and an electrician makes about half maybe a little over half of what they would make in the states here but like the wages here have not gone up gone up relative to the uh, cost of living at all like i would probably earn less now in the same job than I would have 10 years ago. There's reasons for that we don't need to get into here, but you know, ultimately there's not really a lot, other than upskilling obviously, um, there's not really a lot I could do to counter that, but I could, could start my, I did start my own business and have, having my own electrical business for a while. Um, but alternatively, you can also put pieces in place to improve your earning potential. So for example, one thing I've pretty much done throughout my entire adult life, apart from a couple of years, um, is build side projects. So I've had things like vending machines, I've started e-commerce stores, I have one now, um, I think I might have mentioned it earlier. Um, you know, I've ha had um, a portfolio of websites I've run, I've done uh, coaching, lots of different things. And as a result, I've made myself and my family more resilient. So now I'm able to run an e-commerce store and it take, takes a while to set these things up. Like anybody out there who's telling you that it's gonna be easy to set a business up or set a side hustle if you prefer the term up, it's not easy, it does require work. All these videos that are out there that are like five ways to make $500 a week or whatever, they all, they, I wouldn't want to say they're BS, but the way that they pitch them to you is BS. You know, you're not gonna go and knock on a hundred, well maybe you would, but in general, you know, uh, if you're gonna like start a lawn mowing business, you're not gonna be at $500 a week in the first week. It's just, it's very unrealistic. So what you need to understand is it takes work to put these things in place. Like for my e-commerce store, at the moment, I'm doing a restock, and that's it's a lot of work to do that. It's going to take me a few days. But in general, from the day-to-day -day running, after all the work that I've put in place, now I probably spend two to four hours a week on it uh, at most. And you know, it doesn't it's not making me rich or anything like that, but it is providing a substantial income to help sustain my family uh, relative to the work. Like 
more hourly than I'd make as an electrician, <laughs> even 10 years ago. <laughs> so the, the idea is that you as a man, um, unfortunately, perhaps now need to look at alternatives to help support your family and help provide some kind of uh, safety cushion. Um, and that might be uh, building a, a, a business out of your investments. There's, there's lots of options you could do there. We're not going to go into them. Um, but the, the idea is that you're putting something in place that you, are, you have some level of control over that you can uh, scale effectively. So ideally, you do something that is suited to your skill set that you enjoy, that perhaps you can get your children involved with and can earn you more than you would, maybe not even more than you would in your job, but has the potential to scale up to make more than you would in your job. Um, and hopefully more per hour uh, after all the setup work's done. But if you aren't doing that and um, you're not really aware of the world that we're living in, then hopefully this is like a wake up call because in the current age, we are given so many tools at our fingertips, literal fingertips. Like you got to likely, if you're listening to this audio, you're listening to this on your phone. Um, or maybe if you're watching the video, you are sitting at your computer, but still probably within an arm's reach, there's this little black mirror uh, device that uh, is called a phone. And that has more power inside of it than, um, if you believe we went to the moon, than the equipment that they used to get us to the moon. So the idea is that you can use this technology, this, uh, I mean, it can be a, it can be a blessing and a curse, and you can let it be a curse, or you can leverage it to turn it into a blessing. It's not going to magically make your life better. I don't think a phone passively has ever made anybody's life better, um, or a computer for that matter. But the idea is that you can leverage it in such a way that you can build something to help your family. You can use it to sit there and watch meme compilation videos, or you can use it to create educational content on something that you are knowledgeable about. You might be a carpenter. You can help make people better at carpentry. It's, I mean, that's kind of blowing up on YouTube at the moment. Maybe that's just me. Maybe it's because I like making stuff. But, um, you know, there's there's lots of um, lots of good opportunities out there. And if you're sleeping on it, then you're kind of doing yourself a disservice. Because now is like the, the golden age of the individual, uh, I suppose. And not saying that like prioritizing individualism, but you, are, you have so much more opportunity now as a result of this technology that so many guys aren't taking advantage of that it seems almost criminal because um, if you aren't using it as a tool, it's, it's using you as a tool effectively. And you can start very easily. It doesn't have to be a high cost thing for you to start. You don't have to go and rent a storefront like you would have in the old days to start a business. Like let's say you want to start a um, uh, uh, an e-commerce store like what I do. If I were to do this, say, 20 years ago, I would have... Yeah, 20, 20 years ago, I think it's pretty fair, maybe 30, but let's say 20, um, versus the tools that I mean, okay, even if we go back 20 years, there wouldn't be the platforms now that are so easily accessible to be, build an e-commerce store. Go back another 10, you'd have to rent a storefront. So over time, it's becoming more affordable, and we're kind of at this peak point now, where like, the platform that I use for my e-commerce store, WooCommerce, is free. The code that I've done, I've done myself from learning from websites. The, and ChatGPT now, it's even better than that. You know, I've had a problem and I've been like scratching my head, looking at the code, I'm like, am I an idiot? I can't work this out. I chuck it in ChatGPT and it's like, oh, here's the problem. And I'm like, oh, I guess, I guess maybe I am an, an idiot. <laughs> but ChatGPT works it out almost instantly, it's crazy. So we have, and it's free, you know? And so it's getting even cheaper and more affordable. And we're kind of at this peak now where like, if you are able, if you feel unable to set something up, I don't really get what your hang up is. You know, I mean, I'm not like a programmer by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, for me, piecing things together from websites, uh, I was able to put you know, an entire store together that does all right, you know, and, and it's not like I have to pay a web dev to set this whole website up. There's WooCommerce. And if you don't know how to operate WooCommerce and install into WordPress, well, there's YouTube. You can watch YouTube videos on how to do it. And if you don't know how to use YouTube, then get out of the rock that you're underneath. It's just a few clicks of the mouse or taps of your finger. Now, there's, there's not really anything holding you back at this point. And if you do take action, and it does take time, and it does take work, but set it up, then you will prepare your family for anything. If there's, like, I'm putting all the prices on my stuff up at the moment because, you know, the economy isn't looking so good. And things need to cost, things cost more 
to buy at the supermarket. Things cost more to buy from wherever and it cost me more to buy the stock. So I'm putting the prices up to reflect that. I control the prices of that and it will still sell. You know, I'm not, I'm not, a bar, I'm not a bargain bin business by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, I, I have to put the prices up to reflect that. And as a result, I make more money greater than inflation. So I've taken the control back from that. And you can do the same by leveraging these tools to build something for yourself and your family. And the best place to start is by starting up a social media account. I know crazy people sit there and scroll their lives away, whatever, but without an audience to reach, you'll struggle to get customers into your business. We're not in the golden age of search algorithms or, or whatever now. Getting traffic from Google will take years. It's taken me years to get to the point where I get organic traffic, but you can leverage channels that exist out there in order to attract customers to you. And the best one to do that is to find people who like you, like what you can do, and like what you put together and trust you enough to purchase from you. And starting a social media account, easy, easy. Just we would we just avoid, you know, clicking on the thirst traps, I suppose. I don't know. I don't use Instagram, but whatever whatever platform you use, you know, it's 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 um will tailor itself to suit your audience or the audience that you want to build. And you can start I mean, you can start building it for for you know half an hour a day or whatever. Ultimately it's gonna probably take a little more than that, just being honest. But you can start with a, just a little bit of time every day until you, you know, adjust and improve and get better. Now this is kind of a long-winded pitch, but we do have a group that both Jake Trent and I are a part of called Lords of X, and this is where we help you build up an X account. It's excellent for if you are a bit time limited or you don't want to do visual content um, or you prefer writing or you're just getting started. Um, there's, there's not really any better platform than X, especially because it's innovating all the time. And Lords of X is a group of men who are building online. So if you want to build something for your family, you don't know where to start, or you have started and you want to get more traffic, or you want to attain the skills to build something sustainable so you can help provide for your family and prepare them for the future, then Lords of X is an excellent place to help get you on the right track and meet the right kind of men to help you get to where you want to go. I didn't intend for that to turn into a pitch, by the way, but I just thought that, that was kind of a relevant uh, time to bring that up. Uh, another thing that is going to take you to build something or prepare or whatever it is, is making sure you understand the concept of delayed gratification. So Trent, why don't you tell us a little bit about your book? Oh yeah. So, well, one last thing I will say, um, you mentioned like using your phone to like scroll memes and stuff, but my big thing was always playing video games. And I would say that for me, I've been doing, um, I've been doing side projects and stuff also for like 10 plus years but for me that always scratched the same itch as video games did so for anybody out there that's looking to better themselves better their lives or better the lives of their family um trade not you don't have to trade all of it but trade most of your video game time for building something online um and i think that you'll you'll find that you enjoy it um especially if you're somebody that's into like sim type games or games where you like to see numbers go up. So um, that's my little addition to, to Ben's pitch on uh, Lords of X. It's a great community. Uh, but in saying all that, um, I was inspired to write this book um, partially by these two men that I'm joined with, uh, Ben and Jake. Uh, to those who wait, it's a book all about delayed gratification. I talk about the five main facets of life as far as, uh, as I'm concerned, our faith, family, finances, fitness, and friends. Um, delayed gratification is really the, the foundational building block of making improvements in your life. Uh, so I wanted to start from the base level and build up from there. It has a lot of uh, my own um, personality put into it. It's a raw conversational piece. And it's basically like if you and I sat down at a cafe and I just hashed out every piece of advice that I would that I could possibly give you, it's all in there. So um, I've built a nice life for myself and my family, and I want the same for you. Very clear, very succinct. And I have read the book cover to cover. One of the few books in my life that I have sat down and read cover to cover in one sitting. So that, let that be the glowing review that you need to uh, go and check it out. Because um, I'm not like, I'm not like 
a bad reader but i don't read as much as i would like to but trent's book was very hard to put down once i started it so get it read it try not to lose it in an afternoon uh, sitting there reading the whole thing but you'd probably come up better off for it um and yeah i i i, I fully back the book the very very good book um and it does really feel like a conversational piece coming from trent um, like like he's like he sat me down on a couch and uh, and uh, a very comfortable couch <laughs> and uh, started telling me all about what it takes to uh, build this build make a success of your life. So um, yeah, de- definitely recommend it. And um, Jake, he is our resident marriage expert. And um, whenever I am faced with an issue, um, you know, I don't think any marriage is perfect. Um, so if I'm ever faced with an issue, I always look to Jake and uh, for a bit of guidance, a bit of direction. So uh, why don't you tell us a bit about what you've been working on, Jake? Yeah, so kind of with the theme that we were talking about a bit ago, where we we talked about how, you know, there's lessons to be learned in each, you know, thing that we don't get right the first time. So I'm in a unique position, you know, as of just this year where I've now been with my wife for a longer portion of time than what I haven't been with her in my life. And so essentially what I wanted to do was create something for people that was not just like you see sometimes where people just try to show their highlights, but to take the lessons that I've learned some of which the hard way for things that I've gotten wrong over the course of our marriage so far and share it in a way that, you know, people could one could, could relate to. And secondly, that, that anybody could benefit from because, you know, and Ben, you just mentioned this, there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. And even if you're that couple that is doing great and you've been married for 25 years or whatever it is, you know, there's something to be said for always trying to find ways to make things better. And essentially what I tried to do was create the type of resource that I think I would have wanted whenever I was going through the worst parts of my own marriage. And and so, you know, it's a collection of, of lessons learned that I, put into the, a course format. One of the other things that I really like about it is it's not just listening to me. I mean, I have a lot of my thoughts that I share on there, but there are activities that you can do where you take what's in the course and find ways to apply it to your own marriage, which I think is a really good way to, to drive it home for each individual couple. And so I like to say for for less than the cost of going out and having a dinner for two, you can find something that could potentially um impact your marriage for for the the remainder of your time together and i would definitely make those dinners for two more enjoyable as well i would i would would add to that um and and kind of tying it all back in to the the you know being prepared there working on your marriage is like preparing for life you know without a partner by your side everything else becomes a struggle if you're not aligned on your vision aligned on your purpose and aligned in your relationship goals then you know everything's going to be a struggle and no matter how many cans of corn you stack in the pantry or how much pemmican you prepare or how good your generator is and, and that it can run the fridge, I think the top priority for a man, um, at least a married man, should be his marriage. Because without that, everything else starts to struggle. So definitely check out Jake's course. Um, like I said, I, I fully back him. and I, I, I trust him for guidance in my own marriage as well so i i really think jake's course is, is good value um, and with that i think we are done here gentlemen so thanks for your time today and um we managed to keep it pretty tight today especially considering i started out with the black blank document once again <laughs> so we're getting better at this guys <laughs> yeah it's going pretty well for us yeah, yeah for yeah. sure all right guys well you guys take care and thanks to anybody listening and we'll catch you on the next one thanks fellas see ya